Hi, my name's Hudson, and I'm a geoholic. Man, I needed that. <laughs> That's a pick me up. I'm totally amped for this episode, man. Oh, man. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geoholics podcast. Guess what? We made it to episode 84. What did you come up with for 84 tunes? After this week, I had to go with Shannon Sharp. He had the greatest phone call on television ever. Did you see what he did? Of the recent one. Yeah, with yeah. Julio Jones. <laughs> hey, you're, he doesn't even mention that he's on the air. <laughs> I'm out of Atlanta, bro. <laughs> like, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was actually a seventh round pick, number 192 in the 1990 draft. I did not know that. I thought he would be way higher than that. I know that either. Uh, Three time Super Bowl champ, eight time Pro Bowler, four time first team All Pro, NFL 1990s All Decade team. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2011. Who's his brother? There's another sharp brother. Shannon Sharp and I'm, I'm drawing the other a blank. One? The other one? Shannon and I don't know. I know there's another sharp. Yeah, there is. There's another yeah. sharp. <clears throat> All right. Sharp, sharp with an E. There you go. All right. Good stuff. Good pick. I can't remember I like the other it. one now. Now you, you put me on the spot. Well, while I'm doing this, you I look, can look it, it up and you'll get back. <laughs> Sterling. Like thir- Sterling Sharp. Done. There you go. Just like that. All right. So I got to tell you guys, I mean, it's doing those two episode weeks are like emotionally draining. Like last (laughs) week, like I just now recuperate from that. I think it's crazy. You're you're tired, huh? I am. And you know what? I've been doing some deep thinking about this and producing these episodes is a lot like conceiving a child. Okay. You ever look at it that way? No. <laughs> well, hear, me, hear me out on this. First, there's like the planning, right? So yes. you're like, you're courting the guest, you know, you're getting to know each other a little bit. And it's like, you know, should we have this kid or not type thing? You know, you're kind of going through this in your mind. And then you make the commitment, right? Mm-hmm. And you prepare for the show or the, you know, make, uh, write up the agenda, the questions, et cetera. And then there's the recording, right? Yes. As we're doing right now. The hype. And yes. It's so well, good. the recording is kind of like the intercourse portion, I think. Okay. So I never thought of it of, like this. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it kind of, because think about it, you know, it could go either way, you know, and then ultimately we figure it out. And then in the end, everybody's happy. And then, and then Jake puts out a baby for us. Boom. Just like, well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> so if you're still with me, finally, there's the birth, right? And that's well, no, they're editing. Let's call the editing as compared to the incubation period. Okay. Right. The, the Jake part. Okay. Okay. And then there's the birth, which is when the episode goes live for all the world to enjoy. Right? Absolutely. I'm with you. Then we nurture the episode to good health on all by those social media, promoting it in every way possible, you know, and then these little episodes take on a life of their own and ultimately grow up and move out of the house. <laughs> We move on. We move on, right? Yeah. All right. That was quite the analogy. I like it. (laughs) I'm going to stop myself. Shoot. Since we have no PJ today, um, Uh, tell us about that opening number, would you? uh, Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue, one of the greatest bands of all time, is an American heavy metal band formed in Los Angeles in 1981. Group was founded by bassist Nikki Six, drummer Tommy Lee, lead guitarist Mick Mars, and lead singer Vince Neil. Motley Crue has sold over 100 million albums worldwide. That's impressive. They has, they have also achieved seven platinum or multi-platinum certifications, nine top 10 albums on the Billboard 200 chart, including 1990, 1989's Dr. Feel Good, Love which it. is Motley Crue's only album to reach number one, 22 top 40 mainstream rock hits, and six top 20 pop singles. On March 22nd, 2019, the band released four new songs on the soundtrack for It's Netflix biopic, The Dirt. Great movie. If you've not seen it, watch it. Based on the band's New York Times bestselling autobiography. I normally plug in like a story about the featured band about Mm -hmm. this time, but I'm going to (laughs) hold off because I do have a Motley Crue story. Of course you do. But it involves a strip club. Uh, and if you're listening to this still, you already think I'm crazy. So I'm going to save that one for another time. How's that? Just that that's on the, uh, the geoholics after dark. Yeah, episode. exactly. You got to pay extra for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're at the, uh, of course, at the Diamondback Lands Bank studio. We love being here. Uh, it, if you're ever in Arizona, I mean, We'd love to have you come by for a beer. I mean, open invitation. Um, and one thing I do want to mention, 
it just so happens that Diamondback Lancerman is our featured friend of the program. But before How I even convenient. get to that, I want to mention Trent Keenan's Mentoring Mondays. We don't mention that enough. You know, this is a huge opportunity to learn something new every week about serving and so much more, really. So check out his website, mentoringmondays.xyz. As I mentioned, our highlighted friend of the program this week is Diamondback Land Surveying. Diamondback Land Surveying provides complete surveying, mapping, and construction staking solutions for residential, commercial, and public works projects. DBLS is a firm made up of highly skilled professional land surveyors with over 200 years of experience in the public land survey system and construction surveying. Diamondback's seven professional surveyors are licensed in Arizona, California, Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oregon, South Dakota, Utah, Washington, and also they also have a licensed uh, CFEDs on staff. Wow, they got a lot going on over there. Was, Our survey I, was, team, I was counting. I know, you, you <laughs> tracked me with the finger <laughs> thing. Our survey teams take great pride in being professionals, their survey team, all aspects of their work, and emphasize on-time service that maintains an excellent reputation in the construction development communities by consistently providing top-notch service to their clients. Find them at www.diamondbacklandsmarine.com. As they say, they are dedicated to building and maintaining an excellent reputation. I apologize now to TK. Obviously, I didn't pre-read that, and I was a mess. Well, as you said, they're dedicated to building and maintaining an excellent <laughs> reputation, and I can confirm that. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, we are, we are, we're moving on to the Trimble Geospatial Weekly Podword, and we're going to go with Diesel this week. You like that you, one? You went diesel over Camaro, huh? We used Camaro last time. I know. <laughs> so we're using diesel. <laughs> so here's what you do. Listen every week. Make note of each episode's pod word. At the end of the month, email said pod words to us. Uh, and your name will be entered into the drawing for that month's listener prize, which this month is a $100 Amazon gift card. So again, this week's pod word is diesel. Let's catch up with the how, boys. How do you spell that one? D-I-E-S-E-L. All right. Good job. You there passed. you go. There you go. Uh, I will usually catch up with the boys, but there's only two boys in the, in the studio today. I can do the Jake. How are you now? PJ got, <laughs> yeah, PJ got us started. He had to run to a meeting because we are recording in the middle of the day and it has been a crazy day to say the least. No Every, everybody's a little off kilter. So I, we apologize in advance if this show sounds like we're off the rails. Yep. Yep. Because we are. Shoots, exactly. What, what, what's new with you, man? I I went to the D-backs game last night, uh, left in the seventh inning because they were getting their backsides handed to them. What are they on, a nine-game losing streak now? I think that was nine. Yeah. yeah. So that was the excitement of my life. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because, like I said, we're off the rails already and we're going. We got a lot to get to. We're going sideways. <laughs> so what's up with you? Oh, kind of the same thing. I think I might have said enough earlier, but let's um, let's hear about the strip club and Motley Crue. No, let's move on to this. Let's go. <laughs> let's talk about. Uh, I'm kind of like you know into the motivational self help books or whatever mm -hmm. audio books because I really don't read. But apparently, I, I mean, I, I need a lot of that. Is what it boils down to. And I highly recommend Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. If you haven't read mm -hmm. or listened to it, it's phenomenal. And I'm sure it's a great read, but it's an even better listen, I assure you, because there's something about the way, you know, Matthew McConaughey talks. It's super engaging. So I'd highly recommend it. Check it out. Man, oh, man. Tons of good takeaways from uh, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Free plug. Don't get used to it, by exactly. the way. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Safety apparel, safety share, and other things to worry about. Shoots, what do you got? Uh, we got ticks this week. Well, I don't have Good ticks. One. We got worms. Crabs. Ticks. <laughs> when employers think of safety meeting topic ideas, they don't often consider having a safety meeting about ticks. But at least once a year, if employees are working in environments where they could be exposed to ticks, while on the job, it would be a good idea to go over these important points with the team. Inspect your work area before starting for signs of insects, including ticks. Workers outdoors may be exposed to diseases spread from bites of infected ticks. Ticks may carry bacteria, parasi parasites, or viruses, including Lyme disease. Ticks may be found in wooded areas, high grass, or thick brush. Ticks are seen during the spring, summer, and fall, but in warmer areas, they can be active year-round out here. But we don't really, do we have ticks out here? That's a good question. Maybe up north. Okay. Yeah. So check skin and clothing for ticks daily. If bitten by a tick, it should be removed as soon as possible. That's a no-brainer. To remove a tick, follow these steps. Using tweezers, grasp the tick firmly as close to your skin as possible. Pull the tick's body away from your skin with a steady motion and clean the area with soap and water. Those little suckers, their heads like get in under your skin. Mm -hmm. That's it's why like you were saying, I mean, you got to get right down 
almost below the skin and grab them with that tweezers and yank them out. I mean, man, I hate those suckers. I remember the summers, summers in the Northeast. It, yep. My mother would always yell at me. Well, you gotta watch out for ticks and ticks get Lyme and, disease. Ticks and, and chiggers. Exactly. They were the worst <laughs> combination of the two. Your life is a living hell. All right. Thank you for that. Shoots. Absolutely. Let's move on to our guests today. And that is plural. Yes. We have uh, Parker and Jake. Well, Jacob, but we're going to go with Jake. Uh, he said, it's okay. So I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves. So let's just do your real quick, you know, just give us your name, current job or role. And let's go with weirdest thing you've ever eaten. I kind of like that one. So Parker, you go first. Great. Thanks guys. Uh, really enjoyed uh, uh, connecting with you guys today and, and talking GIS. Nothing better than that. Right. So uh, my name is Parker Henson. I'm the GIS lead for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Fantastic. And you're, you're okay putting your career at risk by being on with us today? I think it's pretty safe, but, but, but yeah, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten, Parker? Oh, goodness. Um, I would say, well, it is Florida, so there's a lot of weird things here, but um, believe it or not, so they, they actually do a uh, invasive species kind of hunt each year, and uh, a lot of the colleges will actually have what's called a beast feast, and so I've tried python, tried what? iguana, tried, uh, yeah, um, so I, probably python is, is pretty, pretty much up there, yeah. <laughs> wow. How was uh, iguana, just out of curiosity? Not as good as Python, but uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, very, very chewy, regardless. Uh, I think I think everything has just a, a hint of spice of chicken, but sure. <laughs> so, so next time Python's on the menu, I'm ordering it. You're all over that <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> for sure. All right, Jake, you're up. Name, current job, and uh, weirdest thing you've ever eaten. All right, so uh, Jake Roger. Uh, came on to the show today to talk most about my role in the uh, South Carolina Air National Guard woman engineering assistant. Uh, so I'm responsible for a lot of the surveying GIS that goes on um, on that base. And then uh, for my civilian job, I'm a GIS analyst at Larson Design Group. Uh, we're an AAC firm um, with about a dozen offices here in the uh, mid-Atlantic region. And then we do have a small office in uh, Phoenix of like three or four people within oh. our uh, retail division. So <laughs> never been there, but maybe I can find an excuse to you know, come out, come out and visit y'all while I'm out there. Absolutely. Stop I'm by the studio. For sure. <laughs> yep. Beers on shoots. Um, um, I'm so glad but, you, you said your last name because if I had to take a shot at that, I probably had like a 50, 50 chance of getting it right. And I would have gotten it wrong. Rougeau, no way. I <laughs> yeah. would have said Ro I, Rogo, Ro Rose. I get Rougeau a lot. And that actually might be the way it's supposed to be said, but you know, it's yeah. kind of morphed over time. Um, but then that, that's what actually, yeah. I mean, I mean, nobody ever gets it right. And like when I proposed to my wife, for example, like shortly thereafter, I was like, you know, if you're going to do this, you're going to spend the rest of your life telling everybody how to say your last name. So, <laughs> so just, just want to make sure you're committed. <laughs> well, I mean, if you could have taken her last name. That's always not uh, yeah, possible, right? That's too uh, but, I mean, come on. <laughs> that's the uh, generation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and you know, grew <laughs> up in Drake rural Pennsylvania. You know, they're not quite that evolved yet. So. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And uh, be uh, before we can't let you get away from it, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Um, well, go along with that theme. One of the first things that popped in my mind was um, you know, uh, standing and eating a squirrel when I was about eight Ooh. years old because you know that's you know what you do when you you know grow up surrounded by woods you know you go out with your dad and your grandpa and you you know you find something to shoot and you eat it yeah there you go <laughs> I, my dad and grandpa were not that uh no manly apparently <laughs> <laughs> man I don't know you know I think I've actually had squirrel before it was pretty good yeah yeah. Tastes like chicken, like everything else. You know, exactly. I, I but yeah. it's it's a lot of work, though. You know, for because it's a lot of work. Big. Yeah, so it's a lot of work yeah. for you know the, the meat you get. 
Yeah, it's not worth it. Just wrap it in bacon. <laughs> wrap it in bacon. It'll be fine. Just like just anything else. It makes everything better. Just eat bacon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, we have two GIS experts with us today. So our topic is GIS. I think this is the first like true GIS um, episode we've had. Absolutely. So I'm pretty excited about this. And I'm probably going to ask some really dumb questions, but that's okay. Bear with me. I think the first thing we should do is define what, uh, you know, GIS is. Of course, it stands for Geographic Information Systems. But let's get into it just a little bit deeper. And I'm curious to hear your guys' take on this. So, Parker, how would you define GIS? Sure. Um, well, so I kind of see GIS as, as both a system and a science. So the S kind of meaning both. Um, to me, the GIS system or the GI system is a framework that provides the ability to capture and analyze spatial data. Um, whereas the science, the GI science is the actual scientific study, you know, of various geographic concepts, of applications, um, and of the systems themselves. Um, so to, to me, like a GIS can be uh, a tool, um, but it's very technology based, and it really allows a user to kind of create queries, store and edit spatial um, or non-spatial data. Um, analyze or model that information, and then eventually visually share it in the form of a map. Really good explanation. Jake, what can you add to that? Um, yeah, Parker, that was awesome. Uh, one thing I'll add, you know, since this is more of a podcast targeted towards, you know, surveyors, and that's usually, you know, your typical show, and so you're talking about, you know, a lot of experience in, you know, TVC and AutoCAD and um to me, like uh, one, of, one of the things that really separates uh, GIS from those is, you know, the attribute and tabular data and the, the spatial analysis that can then be done uh, with that information. Gotcha. And I did some research and I know and I understand there's, you know, there's spatial data and attribute data. How, how do you define or how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you define those two things and how do they tie into GIS? And Jake, I'll let you go first on that. Sure. So your, your, your attribute data is just, you know, um, what is used to describe um, whatever feature that, you know, you're displaying um, at any given point or, you know, um, area uh, within the earth. So, uh, for example, I work a lot with utilities. So if you have a water system, your attribute information is going to be, you know, your line type, your line material, um, your, your different valve types, you know, is it a shutoff valve, is it a, you know, check valve, and it just defines, you know, the, the um, the spatial data uh, that you visually see on the map. So is attribute data your metadata? I think, I think the spatial data is the metadata, is it? Yeah, that, that's how I would kind of see it is that the, you know, the, the attributes themselves are, are the values within the table. So you have your different fields or, or attributes, you can kind of think of it that way. So each column would be a particular attribute. Um, yeah. And then gotcha. metadata is the data that describes the data. So metadata is going to kind of it, it would it would go into further description as to what each field was. So like Jake was saying, um, you know, water type or water pump type. Um, maybe that's written in the table as just pump W, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. And so the the metadata would help further further define and, and explain that particular field. So what do you call the data that describes the data that describes the data? The meta meta data data. <laughs> <laughs> Without even hesitation. Gotcha. I know he nailed it. It was a test. You like you've been asked that before. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So I did a little research because I was like, how freaking long has GIS been around? So um what I found out, 1854, I don't know, I don't know how true this is or whatever, but what I found out is one of the most famous, this is 1854, one of the most famous early examples of spatial analysis was in London when Dr. John Snow was able to predict the occurrence of the cholera outbreak. Thanks to the study that Snow released, officials from the government were able to determine the cause of the disease, which was contaminated water from one of the major pumps. The map that Snow developed had the capability of analyzing the phenomena relating to the geographical positions. And this was the first time the world was witnessing this type of data. So, and you worked with them on that, right? But this could happen. They did this in 1854, <laughs> but yet with COVID, they can't even freaking figure uh, it out, right? <laughs> man, oh man. So, I thought Parker and Jake would have figured this out for us, but. 
<laughs> he's the DP guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> so from like a historical perspective, um, Jake, I'll let you go first on this, but you know, what, what are some of the first like real examples uh, of GIS? Like kind of when this started to make a breakthrough? Um, well, I, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll reference, you know, Esri, which um, basically everyone in the U.S., that, that's the uh, software that they use when doing uh, their GIS and, you know, international as well. I you know, there's also QGIS, which, I, you know, I probably get into that discussion yeah. a little later. But I, Esri was founded in, you know, in the 1960s. Um, so that was really, you know, I guess you can call it, you know, the, the birth of the foundation of, you know, the modern GIS that's grown into, you know, um, everything we have today, which I, GIS is to the point now where um, we're all, as GIS professionals, we're always going to be learning that there's always new technology, new applications being rolled out. So that's one of the great things about the career field is you just never stop learning and growing as a professional. Gotcha. Is there an artificial intelligence component to GIS, Parker? Oh, certainly. I mean, well, and, and now as we get more into big data, you know, the, the idea of deep learning um, and using algorithms to really deep dive into large, large amounts of data, um, terabytes size of, of data, wow. um, you would certainly need, you, would cer you certainly need sophisticated modeling uh, for, uh, for that and a really good computer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the questions I was going to ask a little bit later on. I mean, when you have these massive, massive uh, file sizes, I mean, how the heck are, are folks able to manipulate that? I guess the whole thing depends on the deliverable and what the end user is capable of, uh, of analyzing, I guess. I don't know. Using, yeah. Functionality, yeah, for sure. So GIS and geospatial, are they, are they one and the same? Jake? No, um, the way I see it is GIS is, you know, it's a subset of a, geospatial to me geospatial encompasses um any kind of you know location-based uh technology so that would you know include your, your surveying and geomatics career fields as well mm -hmm. gotcha uh parker anything to add to that yeah there's um so so yeah that, that was that was a really good good description uh for me gis typically refers to like again like this system um where geographic information is stored in tables and layers and, and then integrated with other like software programs. Um, and then geospatial is, is like you mentioned more of this broader term that really indicates that the data, you know, has some type of geographic component to it. So for example, you know, the, the records in a data set have locational information tied to that record such as coordinates or an address or zip code, right? Um, and so then the GIS data is a form of geospatial data. So I'm curious, Parker, like for example, in, in Florida, is the basis for like a, uh, a city GIS, is it state plane coordinates, like state plane grid coordinates? I mean, how, how does that typically work? Sure, uh, it, it's very dependent on the actual, you know, on the actual county to use it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we do have our, our north, south, um, um, different coordinate systems that, that are used. Typically we use ALBERS. So we have a form, um, at least here at the Department of Environmental Protection, we, we, use, um, uh, we use ALBERS projection. Um, and then for all of our web-based applications, you know, we'll work with WGS 84 for a web creator. So kind of kind of depends on where you are in the state. Um, Florida is very uniquely shaped. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, um, not as not as square as Indiana and uh, not as rectangular as Tennessee. So we, we kind of have both of those going on. Um, yep. As Homer Simpson calls it, that's America's wang. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, that's funny. Uh, Jake, talk, talk a little bit about uh, the, the geospatial side of GIS and the basis for, uh, for the GIS systems you've worked with. Um, so, yeah, to kind of piggyback off of Parker, um, uh, with my role right now at Larson Design Group, I deal primarily with local governments. And I, off the top of my head, I believe they all use um, their local you know, state plane coordinate system. Um, for all their data. But then, uh, like Parker mentioned, um, once you 
you know, publish that data online, you know, all your, your map viewers that, you know, are publicly available that I'm sure we've all come across, they're all, you know, displaying that data um, in a web Mercator. So you have that um, um, on the fly um, reprojection that happens whenever you, you publish the data um, from, you know, the geo database where it's hosted into that online environment. So I'm curious, Jake, when you like, for example, when you were going through, you know, your post-secondary education, uh, how many survey classes did you take? Zero. 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 Uh, Parker, how about you? Uh, officially zero survey based. Um, I did get, take a few in urban and regional planning um, departments, and, and that at least allowed us to study, study survey methodology and, and, and that type of thing, kind of get more of a hands-on experience with that. Um, uh, we actually, so the Florida Geological Society is, is housed under DEP here, and we do have some really cool things going on with benchmarking. So I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure surveys have, have heard of that, but um, certainly something that we're familiar with and more familiar with now. But, yeah, you know, a, a coordinate class in surveying is, is just that. It's a multi-semester uh, endeavor. Sure. <laughs> you, you don't just learn, learn that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, for sure. So what classes did you take that like the provided the education about, you know, dipping different mapping planes and different mapping projections. Um, you know, what, what, what class was that that taught you that? For, for me, that was found, uh, you know, foundational GIS. Um, uh, there were a few and I took some regression modeling, which might not have sound like getting into, into surveying, but there were a number of projects that were survey based just, just because the instructor, mm -hmm. um, and then just some work and, and meeting with friends really who were in Florida uh, Forest Service and, and were doing a lot of a uh, lot more surveying than I was at the time. Now I was doing doing field mapping, um, but that's completely separate component, you know, than surveying. So. Sure. How about you, Jake? Um, See, so yeah, I took a couple of tar cartography classes, and uh, kind of like Parker mentioned, you know, your intro to GIS classes, you know, touch upon. Uh, you know, different projections because it, you know it's something that happens all the time in, in GIS. You're going to get data from a client, and it's going to be in a different projection than what you need or what they want as a final product. So you got to know you know how to shift things around, or you know you you bring in your data and it's supposed to you know be you know locally like like for me, it's supposed to show up in Pittsburgh, and all of a sudden it's down in Venezuela. That's that was something that just happened the other day to me. So I was like, okay, I need to. This got put in the wrong projection. I got to figure out, you know, what it's supposed to be in. And obviously, you know, with experience, it's something that I can usually figure out pretty quick, um, you know, what projection I'm, I'm looking for and get it fixed. Um, but it's interesting, like through my, you know, six years of college, I don't recall like any of my, either of my degree programs even offering uh, a survey course. Um, and, I, and that's actually why I... <laughs> The, you know, at the age of uh, 28, I decided to make the, the jump and enlist in the uh, Air National Guard because um, with the career I do um, in the Guard, I do a lot of surveying. I was able, through my um, military training, I was able to get that foundation. So um, kind of went a non-traditional uh, route with that. But with the training I received, um, now that I have that under better understanding of surveying and you know get to do it um, now, it's actually in turn made me a better GIS professional because I have that better understanding of the data and, and how it's generated and you know what the surveyor's needs are you know from from a GIS perspective so you know, could kind of have that back and forth where we can help each other and, and can communicate more effectively. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because ever since GIS has kind of come to the the forefront, um, you know, there's always been that back and forth between surveyors and GIS professionals. You know, it's like, you guys aren't surveyors, you know, you shouldn't be drawing lines on maps and, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And it yeah. still goes on today, unfortunately. But yeah. hey, the bottom line is, I mean, you know, kudos to the GIS professionals. And I mean, pretty much, I don't want to say every, every uh, university, but almost most universities have GIS programs, mm -hmm. you know, whereas like hardly anybody has survey programs. I think we're down to we like talk about that all the dozen. time, like 15 <laughs> or something like that. So, you know, the whole, the GIS folks did something right. That's for sure. Um, 
So kudos for that. They were better at promoting the profession. That, yes, they're not wrong. <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, we should take take lessons, no doubt. <laughs> All right. So there's different types of GIS data. We touched on a little bit earlier. Um, it's my understanding there's vector and raster uh, data. So Parker, tell us a little about those two different types of data. Oh, sure. One of the classic questions. This is great. Uh, always ask my students this one, or uh, if I'm, uh, it's, it's so important. Um, second to probably understanding coordinate systems, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Um, okay, so uh, uh, vectors are simply points and lines or polygons, you know, lines that make up polygons, and then rosters are cells, grid cells. So the vector model uses points and line segments to identify locations on Earth while the roster model uses a series of cells to represent those locations on Earth. Um, I, I, I like the old adage that a uh, roster is faster, but vector is corrector. I'm not sure if you've heard that. Um, I get it. <laughs> I like it. But, uh, you know, for, for, again, you know, for, for vectors, there is this idea of vertices and points that help represent real world features, whereas, rosters or cells that can be discrete or continuous um, that that also describe phenomena that are going on but that are just that are presenting pre presented a little differently you know so um, or like roster discrete data might be land use or land cover um, information so you know is or is, is this a particular soil type or is this a full foliage type or is this water um, versus more continuous rosters might be what people classically or typically know as you know temperature, elevation, um, or aerial an aerial photograph. Aerial photograph, speaking your language, but yeah, I know they're yeah. on my they're yeah, on my plane. It. Finally, there you go. I, I saw your uh, <laughs> eye, eye eyebrow raise Ooh, a little bit there. You're like uh, I know what he's talking about. Hey, <laughs> I've taken a few GIS classes in my day. <laughs> All right, Jake, you got anything to add to that uh, explanation of between vector and raster? Honestly, no. Yeah, Parker nailed it. That was, that was, that was awesome. So I, I, I'm circling back. You know, my mind, my mind works in crazy ways, of course. But um, <laughs> so, you know, data collection is a huge part of building any GIS. Do you think there's any advantage to having a, a surveyor uh, collect that data or not necessarily? Yes. Yes? Yes. I, I mean, and then I'm not saying it has to be a licensed surveyor, sure. just an yep. experienced surveyor. Okay. Um, because uh, there's a phrase I've heard a lot and you garbage in, garbage out. Yep. You get garbage data in, you're going to create a garbage product on the, the back end. And then, um, so I think it's vital to have someone, you know, a surveyor at the, you know, the front out collecting the data, someone who knows what they're doing, knows what to collect, how to collect it, you know, what information to include, um, depending on, you know, what software they're using whether you know, they're, they're keeping those notes digitally or even just keeping a field book that they can pass on um, to the GIS person, whoever's gonna be processing that data. But yeah, if you don't have someone who knows what they're doing to start the project just to, to collect the data, then it doesn't matter what kind of you know, skills or experience you have you know, as a GIS professional or a person in the office, you, know, you can't do anything. It's only so much you can do with bad data. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Of all. Mm -hmm. I love that one. Um, so, Parker, I'm going to throw another technical one at you here. So, all this data has to be processed somehow, and we have to draw a pretty picture somehow. Um, so, I'm going to throw some terms out there that, that's going to make me sound smart, but I really don't know what these things are. So, there's there's Python, ArcGIS, and QGIS. Parker, tell us tell us what those three things are. What do they do? So. Uh, com completely se uh, completely separate uh, uh, um, terms there, but let's start with maybe ArcGIS and QGIS. Uh, those are the actual like software systems, um, the GIS that we were talking about, the, the system earlier um, that, that enables you to perform mapping and analysis um, and visualization and, and that type of stuff. The difference is that ArcGIS is owned by Esri, um, uh, who has a large grasp on the on the GIS kind of community, and and they're integrated with a lot of various state and federal agencies. Um, QGIS is open source, so um, there are just there's certain data types and and file types that um, one can use that the that the other can't. 
they typically integrate fairly well. Um, um, there, there are bridge, uh, bridges that can be used and, and tools to transform, you know, one set to another. But typically, someone is either going to be an Esri Art GIS shop or they're going to be a UGIS kind of shop, um, uh, or, or utilize, you know, one, one or the other. Um, mm -hmm. Python is actually a programming language um, that and that is used heavily in both um, to uh, do just that, just to, to perform GIS developments. Um, it's very heavily like math based, uh, so computational, um, it's object oriented. Um, so uh, people, people can work with Python and write queries and write scripts um, that work alongside maybe another language people heard of is like SQL, SQL or JavaScript. So both of those would kind of be considered um, also programming languages, JavaScript on the side of, uh, of, of web development. So a lot of the web maps and things like that that you see are, are built with Java. Yeah. Gotcha, appreciate that. Jake, do you have anything to add? Uh, I would just add, yeah, uh, JavaScript. Um, so a lot of you know, the web apps that you probably come across online are kind of your standard Esri, um, you know, off the shelf, but um, you know, it's always great to have a developer on, on staff that, that uh, could use JavaScript to further customize um, those applications. And then I'll also mention um, uh, Esri does have their own programming language called Arcade. Uh, it's actually really cool to work with because it's able, you're able to kind of um, perform calculations and essentially man manipulate the data without actually changing the data, which wasn't really something you were able to do before then you would have to, you know, in your GIS, if you wanted to calculate uh, population density um, by county, for example, um, you would have to have your county um, field that had, you know, the square mileage of the county and then another field with your population. Then you would have to have a third field to accept that, that answer to figure out your population density. Now with Arcade, you can just do the calculation and it um, calculates the answer and then you can display that in your online map without having to add an additional field um, and have you know, even more data um, to manage. And um, it, it just it brought a whole new level of uh, flexibility to um, doing online um, analysis through your, your GIS data. Interesting. So, I, Jake, I'm gonna let you go first with this one. Um, just thought just came to my mind. So, to become a GIS professional or GIS expert, let's say, would you say that the education? You think it's more education based to reach that level, like post secondary education based, or mentoring? Like surveying, I think is heavy in the mentoring. You know, not so much in the education. Some people can argue with that, but I'm curious what your thoughts are in regards to you know the path to becoming a GIS professional. Sure. Um, so, from my experience, and then from you know, a lot of people I've worked with, um, you know, getting a degree in geography or GIS, and you know, that's what my bachelor's is in. It's in geography. I, yeah, it gave me a great foundation, a great start. Mm. But to become a GIS expert, in my opinion, that you don't need to have that specific degree. Um, and I got a coworker, for example, he's got degrees in um, archeology span and anthropology. And he's a he's top notch GIS professional. And he, he brings a lot to the table you know, for our company. Um, and you know, he basically took one GIS class in college, said, hey, I, you know, I think this is something I might wanna do and you know, opportunity open for him. And I know a lot of people like that, you know, they come from, um, you know, like environmental science or like a biology background and they just kind of touch GIS through their coursework. And then next thing they're, they're integrating it, you know, into their professional career. And then that's kind of the path that their career overall ends up taking. Interesting. How about you, Parker? What's your take yeah, on that? Yep. Um, hundred percent agree that, uh, uh, and personal experience of actually my background is more in public health. So um, I was actually working on my PhD in public health uh, doing like medical geography and, and um, spatial analysis uh, uh, and really just fell in love with the you know, mapping itself and, and the GIS aspect of it. 
So, um, I, I, you know, I didn't have a traditional computer science and then geography and then GIS kind of um, uh, academic background, but I just full deep dive and, you know, into GIS and everything's everything geospatial. And uh, uh, in a lot of ways, it's become a geoholic. <laughs> um, I like it. And, but I also, uh, just to add, uh, I think it really brings a lot to the table where you find these these experts that are doing things in other fields, you know, um, in biology or public health uh, or environmental sciences, and then they can use GIS as a tool for their tool belt. And um, it really enables people to begin to think spatially when you're starting to, when you're not just looking at an Excel spreadsheet anymore, you're actually, in a sense you are, but you're, you're looking at it and you're visualizing it much differently. And it really enables that that subject matter expert to pick out different patterns or to, to analyze different patterns that might not have been so apparent um, uh, in, in a traditional non-spatial kind of data set. So um, I think it's a great tool for a lot of people to have, even if you don't um, do it completely, you know, in your full-time career, um, learning it and understanding it um, gives you one more thing to, uh, to talk about over a year. Yeah, for sure. I like what you said there about thinking spatially. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, another thing I could add to that is the GIS uh, Certification Institute, um, who offers the you know the GISP certification, Geographic Information Systems Professional, which is you know kind of the standard um, as far as cert certifications go in, in our career field. Um, part of their application or portfolio process is an education requirement. Um, which, which you know, they want you to have a bachelor's degree, but that bachelor's degree can be in anything. They don't you know, pigeonhole it to, it has to be geography or GIS, or you know, it can be, you know, it can be in biology, it can be in finance, you know, it can be you know, whatever, and they'll, they'll accept that as your education background. Wow, my, my light bulb's going off right now. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's this is hear another it. thing that's like holding surveyors back right there. You know, that's awesome. Oh, that that arg that old argument yeah. in Arizona. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so why like the to, to achieve the GISP certification, is it like the same requirements across the board state to state, or does it differ from state to state? No, it, it, it's the same across the board. It, it's not run state to state. It's like it's it's the uh, GIS certification certification institute that runs it all. Um, so it's not even state to state. It's it's international. Wow. Um, but and I will say that you know a, a primary difference is you know there's no uh, there's nothing legally binding with the GISP like there is you know becoming a licensed surveyor or, mm -hmm. or a PE. You know the, we don't get we don't have a stamp to to put on anything. It's just it more says you know. Um, you know, we, we have a strong background in GIS, you know, we have that expertise, we, we know what we're, we're doing, you know, we have the work experience, we have the educational background, you know, we um, passed the, the test that, well, that's if you, you know, earned it in the past, I don't know, I think five years or so, they just started to implement a test. Well, um, it used to but, just be like a point system, right? Correct. Um, so yeah, it used to just be like you get submitted a portfolio that was based on your work experience, your education, and then they had contribution points. So that's you know presenting at conferences um, or you know writing journal articles, getting your work published, different ways to earn those contribution points. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm personally, I'm very glad that they um, add the test to it because um, I'm sure Parker probably come across this too. You come across people who had that GISP certification, but really had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> and the test kind of added that extra element is like, okay, we, you need to have a, a solid background in all things GIS to have this certification. Yeah, there's, there, there's been a, a, a number of people who have, who have said that they're a GIS expert, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, most, most people who exit or exit college or getting to that point are experts in everything in their field, right? So um, I think that kind of helps, you know, separate um, you know, some, some from others. It can help with, with, with jobs, uh, obtaining jobs if you're almost equally as qualified as another candidate and they may look at the GISP and say, oh, okay, he's, you know, he's internationally certified as, as a GISP. Um, so 
kind of kind of kind of adds a add a, adds a little badge uh, badge of honor. Um, mm -hmm. It means you paid attention to the coordinates class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that actually is a big part because I was I got iron mine in 2019, so I was part of the group that had to take the test, and I studied for a couple of months leading up to it, and honestly, I was. I was surprised when I got the email saying I passed because after like the first 10 questions, I sat there for a minute and I was just like, there's no way I'm passing this. It may, I may as well just leave now. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the test is no joke. Anyone out there who's considered, you know, taking it highly recommend studying, you know, reaching out to people, you know, myself included, I can tell you what, what you know, what worked for me, but you're not going to just walk in there on test day and pass it. So with the certification, with, with the testing and everything like that, uh, how long is the certification good for and how do you get recertified when you need to? Uh, the certification is good for three years. And then um, the recertification um, process is just an application. Um, it's kind of focuses on the same system. Um, it focuses on your, uh, your work experience and contribution and a little bit of education as well. Of course, you know, um, for most people, won't, you know, they're in their, like my point in your career, you know, you're not going to school anymore. So then it's, you know, conferences and webinars and, you know, different, you know, more informal trainings that you can attend um, to get those education points. But um, yeah, just based on point system, you keep your track of your portfolio um, online. And then when it's time to recertify, you submit and, you know, fingers crossed, you get approved and, you know, fit in your GSP for another three years. So there is a continuing education kind yes. of yeah. requirement. Yep. Yep. So All there's right. just to add, I mean, there's, there's a lot of really great training um, courses out there or like, you know, LinkedIn learning, um, uh, URISA, the, the organization, um, they, they actually, I think they actually have an upcoming GISP um, and a seminar that goes over, over what to expect on the exam. You're right. I think it's like in a couple of days from now. I think, you're right. I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So great timing, <laughs> um, but yeah, check, check, check that out from URISA or like Jake mentioned, um, the GIS uh, CI, which is the governing board. Um, uh, they've got a lot of great info in there, kind of hashing out what you, what you need um, experience because it, it isn't just the test, it's experience. You know, you have to have, I want to say three or five years worth of GIS actual kind of professional project work. Um, and then, and then meet some other milestones, and then you can both apply for your GISP uh, uh, at either after or before sitting for the exam. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about, or we have recently for some reason talked about you know, infrastructure a lot mm -hmm. on a number of the shows, and I have to believe that GIS you know, folks, professionals, experts work closely with like the subsurface utility engineering um, folks. Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah, uh, some of our coordinators here, we have 21 different program areas at UEP and, and each program area has their has its own GIS coordinator. Um, and we actually have, so for our water resource uh, uh, management group and, and then a few others, we, um, there, there are actual engineering specialists that, that do take on that role. And, and I would say, uh, but you missed my experience, um, uh, both military and civilian, has come, you know, in asset management uh, side of GIS. So yeah, heavy involvement in you know, subsurface utility mapping. Um, and in fact, like that's that's pretty much what I do in the military um, and by choice, you know, when, when I decided to enlist, I was like, okay, how can I burst through my country? And it, you know, it was not, you know, being on the front lines. It was like, okay, let me use my brain. Let me use my professional experience. and. So that's, that's what I do is, you know, I do GIS and surveying, you know, from an asset management uh, perspective, um, which serves its own importance because uh, a big part of our job is just keeping all the real property records, uh, a lot of as-built surveys, um, maintaining that attribute information like we talked about earlier, because then all that information gets submitted um, to the National Guard Bureau in BC, they review it. And if you have great property records, when it comes time to you know expand or renovate or what have you, if you have um, um, full records and complete records of what you have on base, they're much more willing to um, give you the the funding to uh, to meet the, those needs and get those upgrades. 
So you mentioned your military background, Jake. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to go a little bit further into that. Um, what experiences have you had with GIS? Something cool that you can mention from that, maybe internationally or, and then at the end of that, uh, transitioning from military to civilian work life. Sure. So uh, actually, um, this time last year, even I was uh, over in uh, Niger, Africa. Uh, I was deployed over there. Um, the base I was at um, still, you know, being constructed, you know, very much tent, tent city, as we call it, you know, there's just rows and rows of, of uh, tents. Um, so got, got to do um, some cool projects over there. Uh, my main project was actually kind of dull and boring, which was um, building their GIS. Uh, they had a lot of stuff in CAD and just, or just a lot of loose files. And it all needed to go into the GIS for those um, asset management purposes that I you know, just mentioned. Um, but did get to do, you know, do some, some cool things over there. Uh, one thing I will mention is um, we got to take a uh, Trimble R10 and mount it to the top of a uh, Polaris dagger, which mm. if you haven't heard of that, it's basically like a dune buggy on steroids. Um, it's as fun as it is terrifying, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, we noticed that in the metal bars on the top of the roll cage, um, one of the, the drill holes drilled in it, the R10 screwed in perfectly to it. <laughs> so it was literally just screwed it in and you know, we did a measure down to, to get our height and we off we went and we just drove this thing, did a continuous topo um, for this big uh, stormwater drainage product project that we had, had to do. Um, because even though we were technically in the desert, um, we did get some, there's a short rainy season and when it rains there, you know, it comes down in buckets, but because the ground's so hard, none of it penetrates. So then it just runs off and floods everything. So um, that, and that alone was quite the experience because before the storm comes in, you get the sand coming through that all, that's all been kicked up from the rain behind it. And it was incredible just to, you know, be kind of caught up in the middle of that. You know, we were all, you know, idiots. The first time one rolled through, we're running outside like, oh, like, yeah, this is Africa. Like, this is awesome. And meanwhile, they were just getting pelted in the face with sand. Um, but um, what, it really hit me though, like just how intense the storm was whenever I opened up the door to the one port john and the inside is completely caked with sand. Oh my God. <laughs> crazy that's crazy sounds like monsoon season i was gonna say yeah it's like arizona yeah <laughs> and also we have a different idea of tent city out here than that <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even gonna comment on that <laughs> how about you parker talk about a, a, a project or two that was pretty cool that you worked on yes um uh, l- lately we've been doing a lot so like I mentioned earlier, we have a number of program areas here at DEP that includes uh, like air quality and monitoring. Um, we do water quality monitoring and assessments. Um, uh, we have, uh, a lot of the algal blooms. I'm not sure if you've kind of seen that in the news recently, mm-hmm. or uh, Florida has kind of uh, uh, had some issues with different nitrites and other um, contaminants getting into in and around Tampa Bay, and then it making its way around the the um, around the bend in Florida, and uh, it really contributes to a lot of like the algal blooms that are that are happening. Um, maybe recently the the oil spills, things like that, that happened out in the Gulf, and then some of the other wastewater uh, issues that have poor Tampa Bay. Man, you know, uh, uh, besides the Super Bowl this last year, the only thing they've got going for them is Tampa Brady. So, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, so we're, we're kind of all over the place, you know, springs restoration, um, parks and recreation uh, makes up about a third of our user base. So uh, uh, mapping greenways and trails and, and park systems and, uh, and, and all of that. So I, I really have, it's kind of a hodgepodge, but I, I love that, you know, I, um, I don't have one favorite cookie. I, I like different types of cookies <laughs> <laughs> and, and desserts. And so I, I kind of feel like I get to um, to work with, with all of those, um, at least in this particular position. So, and on that, so I, I do assist our geographic information officer. So our GIO, 
um, in the office. And then we, we oversee a, a number of state and kind of federal um, in a sense uh, man, uh, initiatives around the state as well. So I'm not sure if you've heard of like the, the next generation 911 um, rollout, which is happening. So we're, we're assisting with, um, with the office for that. Um, we do a lot of collaboration between the different agencies. So Department of Transportation, Department of Revenue, Department of Health, um, and then a lot of the water management districts. So um, water quality is definitely big for us here. Uh, very important. Um, and you can really, really make somebody mad if you uh, uh, quickly by polluting some water here in Florida. <laughs> um, so we, we do a lot of, we, and a lot of that, a lot of regulatory and, and permitting as well. Um, and then I would just like to quickly add probably one of the biggest upcoming initiatives that we have is the uh, coastal mapping initiative. Um, this was all, it's basically official. It's, you know, a couple, couple more signatures are needed, but um, it's gonna provide $100 million uh, in annual funding to uh, the Resilient Florida program. Um, and, and that's just gonna really help um, a lot of the uh, coastal mapping and topo bathymetric mapping um, here in the state of Florida. So we're really excited to, to get that kicked off. Super cool. Um, Shoots, I just changed my title. Okay. I'm PIO. What's that? Podcast Information Officer. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good stuff. So, you know, with... Uh, technology advancing as rapidly as it is, you know, with VR and AI and all this, I mean, what are, what are some applications for GIS that you're really excited about moving into the future? And Jake, I'll let you go first. Um, sure. So in my opinion, yeah, all that, you know, you know, stuff is great. Um, it definitely is part of the future of GIS, but what I'm most excited about is just um, GIS getting, you know, becoming more ubiquitous and getting in the hands of more people and, you know, where your everyday person has a, you know, better understanding of what GIS is and how, you know, they use it, you know, every day. Um, or even, uh, I have a lot of uh, clients at my job right now where the, it's local government and they're trying to get away from doing everything paper-based and they see the advantage of GIS and you know, different mobile applications um, to, you know, now do everything on a tablet and then, you know, as soon as the information gets typed in the tablet, it gets pushed up to, you know, secure server, cloud, you know, wherever, you know, they're, they're um, pushing that information. But, you know, it's no longer pen and paper. Then somebody has to take it out the office, copy it, you know, in the computer. Or, you know, what happens to that paper gets lost along the way. Um, so it really simplifies that whole workflow. And like I said, just getting it in the more... Um, hands of more people like uh, in fact last month I was training a um, 66 year old um, township secretary on how to use um, collector for ArcGIS which is you know one of Esri's um, mobile applications and she was just like you know taken away I was like like I didn't think I'd be doing this and then on top of that I get a call from her like a couple weeks later saying hey I found another use of this GIS this thing you taught me now when an insurance <laughs> company calls me wanting to know how close a property is to a fire hydrant, I can just pull up the GIS records and find the parcel, find the hydrant, and there's my answer. I don't have to go digging anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. You know, and that's one of the things about GIS. I mean, really, it's like the sky's the limit. It's like, it's, mm. it's whatever the mind can conceive, I mean, it's, there's so much you can do. It's, it's really amazing. So you mentioned the data collection portion of it. And be, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that it's my understanding, Jake, that you've had a little bit of experience with the Bad Elf Flex receiver, correct? Yes. So um, Nick from, from Bad Elf, of course, you, you know, Nick, if you listen to the show, um, he was kind enough to um, let me borrow a, a Bad Elf Flex for a few weeks, um, which included uh, my recent National Guard training uh, that I attended uh, in Mississippi uh, is a really awesome project uh, where we were involved in building a, uh, a camp for disabled uh, kids and adults in that area. Um, so it's, things can be really awesome to see when it's all said and done. Um, anyway, so the project got put on pause for because of COVID. We were the second rotation um, back on site. The first rotation that was there, they didn't establish any kind of survey control. They just did shot everything with 
the auto level and reference the finished floor from the design. Um, but we knew we, need, we needed something better. Um, so we get out the survey equipment that they had there for us. They had one R7 for us. So we didn't have any control, couldn't set up a vase. So luckily Nick had given me this bad off flex and I had it with me and I said, hey, I got this and was able to get it all hooked up. Um, and that's how we shot it in our control. And then we were able to just, and you run total station um, uh, to finish up our projects for the two week. Um, but uh, did have a, a nice learning experience when I you know, talk about you know, uh, get, getting that foundation and surveying and you know, how I joined the military for that reason. So um, the first time I shot the control with the flex, I thought everything was good. And then I checked the elevations against the design and I was off and the elevations were off like 90 feet. And I'm like, oh, what's going on here? So I start going through the you know, different um, settings in the flex and then I get to it geoid and yep. it's just blank and i was like oh that's it yep. Yep. so had to go through the process which full credit to the bad elf guys i literally just googled like gi model battle flex and they had a walk through like oh this is how you add a geoid model to the battle flex and it took me you know 10 minutes got it got it all set up and we were back to it and yeah problem solved yeah <laughs> I think the bad elf guys, I think they're on to something with the flex. Yeah, absolutely. I would and say then, it's a free plug, but they, they pay us. Yeah. They do. Yes, yeah. right. Well, I, I do have to add a, uh, a a disclaimer. This this is Jake Rouget, JS survey professional talking. This isn't Jake Rouget, uh, engineering assistant, National Guard. So this is a, you know, this is a personal promotion, nothing yeah. to do with you know, my professional career. It's yeah. okay. Nobody will know how to spell that last name anyway. <laughs> that's right. That's right. They'll never find you. <laughs> All right. So Parker also knows uh, Dr. Nick. So uh, Parker, tell us what you're most excited about as it pertains to GIS into the future. Yeah. Um, I, I think just that, that it's moving into the future. You know, um, we, the past decade, we've, kind of, we've certainly seen improvements in technology and we've now reached this point where Big data and deep learning are kind of becoming, com you know, common uh, terms to throw around. But I, I think it's really going to change a lot that we do with with GIS. And like Jake was saying too, the the ability to now have people out in the field um, collecting asset information, and if something's wrong, they can just call somebody back in the office and have that person make adjustments on their side, you know, to the to the web application, and then it immediately sync. To the people back in the field, that's huge. Um, that has saved tons of time uh, for surveillance and assessment. Um, you don't lose a paper map, um, though I will say I have some paper maps printed behind me and uh, still use them to this day. So you know there there are still needs for plotters. Um, but I I think that's kind of what makes me the most excited. Excited is that it's it's this movement into more three D technologies. Um, I think augmented reality is really going to benefit from GIS. And uh, once that kind of comes about, I mean, think about having glasses that can navigate you somewhere. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's what GIS is going to be able to do um, in the future and kind of harping what I said earlier, but, you know, a lot of state and federal agencies now have their own unique GIS sections. So I, you know, insurance companies have GIS sections. So I, I think that says a lot about like where the field is going, um, where the science is going, um, and kind of where the tech is going. Um, I, there was a really great screenshot that was captured uh, during the recent Mars rover lander landing, and uh, NASA was using ArcMap. Um, <laughs> so it's literally helping us navigate on Mars. <laughs> nice. That's crazy, isn't it? It's amazing. Now you guys are fans of the show, I hope, and you know th this question's coming, and we ask it to everybody. I'll start with Parker. What's a mantra that you live by? Oh, great! Well, I didn't know a mantra <laughs> about the question, <laughs> but um, you guys have certainly been added to to uh, to my favorites, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to kind of be on this show. So, um. I, you asked him first for a reason, didn't you? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to catch him off guard. <laughs> Jake's already got um, his queued up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, like, one of my personal mantras is I, I really try to be 
uh, a good leader and like live ethically. Um, and so a lot of the decisions that I do um, in and around GIS are, are all based on that. It's it's to do good always, you know, and, and that that goes into proper QA, QCing to um, just being a good good person in general. Um, and I, I guess just a, a quick quick mantra would be to stay mappy. <laughs> I like to do good always. Do good always. Do yeah. good always. That's a solid one. What about you, Jake? Uh, so I, I'm going to go with one you know, kind of related to our career fields. Um, it's acknowledge wrong versus different. And it's mm. because in GIS, in surveying, you know, there's, oh. there could be a hundred different ways to accomplish the same task. Um, so, you know, as I grow in my managerial career, being able to acknowledge when someone's doing something wrong and needing to intervene versus when they're just doing it differently than how I would do it and just, you know, letting them, you know, continue to do the work because the end, end result's going to look the same. That's good. That is a solid. Really one. good. And you know, what's really cool about that? I, first of all, I mean, I love the question. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that out of the 90 or a hundred or whatever guests we've had on, there's never been two of the same mantras. No, not one. No, never. Not one. It's so awesome. Except for add value, make friends. That's, 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 that's what just, we live by yeah, now. Yeah, we live by that. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Glenn's key episode six. Uh, all right. Shoot you anything else, man? I'm good. I, uh, now I got to, Put my producer Jake hat on. So well, hold on, don't you're not there yet. Oh, I, I'm I'm let anxious. Me, I, I'm. Let me put a bow on this. Uh, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hey, uh, Parker, thank you so much for uh, being able to jump on with us on short notice. And Jake, of course, thank you as well for being here. And thank you for your service as far as that goes. Um, is there anything that maybe we haven't talked about that you guys want to want to get out there? And Parker, I'll let you go first for that. Um. No, I, I, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of it. I, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing too is kind of this, uh, this differentiation between surveying and GIS. And, and I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, a, a lot of the times like both of those can, can integrate like quite well. Um, yes, they're, you know, they're different fields, but uh, there's definitely a, a place for both of them. And uh, I would uh, really enjoy having surveyors on a GIS team to bring in that foundational knowledge and, and to add that experience. Um, it's very pivotal. So. Yeah. I love that idea. How about you, Jake? Yeah. Just to say, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to bring, you know, more of a GIS element onto the show. Appreciate you having me. And um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So anyone, you know, wants to, you know, reach out, ask me a question, whether it be GIS or, you know, the military more than help, help. I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Um, as we kind of already, you know, addressed, uh, I'm pretty easy to find, you know, in those kind of cases, as long as you figure out how to spell my last name, I'm the only one on there. So you'll find me. <laughs> oh, that's we'll, great. we'll put it, it out it, on it, our social me, media uh, with your last name spelled correctly. What was that, Parker? I was going to say, if you search for me, I'm now friends with Jake. So uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I decided to creep on Parker once I saw he was going to be the, the uh, last minute guest on the, the show. And I was like, oh, if I'm going to creep on him, I'll, I'll see if he wants to connect. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll tell you what, I've got to be honest with you. That's that's kind of the, one of the ripple effects of doing this show is making connections for people. And uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's so rewarding to see, you know, the relationships that blossom as a result. So uh, again, thank you guys so much for yes, being thank here. You. Uh, that's a wrap, right? That's it. Are you ready? Are you, I'm ready. All right. All right. All tee right. it up, tee it up. Here we go. So no doubt another awesome value adding show. Please be sure to check us out at the geoholics.com. Follow us on all social media outlets by searching for the geoholics. Download all our podcasts from just about everywhere. Don't forget to download the Geoholics app from Lance Fairs United. Send us an email at geoholics.com if you have any content ideas or would like to be a guest on a future show. Last but not least, support our friends in the program every chance you get. Pay it forward. Add value. Make friends. Go make some kids. Motley Crew, <laughs> kickstart my heart. Taking us out. Be safe and healthy, everybody. Once again, a shout out to our friends of the program, Aerotech Mapping Inc., ATMLV.com, Advanced Geodetic Surveys Inc., AGSGPS.com, Bad Elf GPS, Bad Elf.com, Cobb Fenley, CobbFenley.com, Cyanic Automation, GetJobBook.com, Diamondback Land Surveying, DiamondbackLandSurveying.com, Get Kids Into Survey, Get Kids Into Survey.com, Land Surveyors United, LandSurveyorsUnited.com. Mentoring Mondays, mentoringmondays.xyz, 
Monson Engineering, monsonengineering.com, Nettleman Land Consulting, nlcprep.com, Parkland Community College, parkland.edu slash surveying, Safety Apparel, safetyapparel.us, Tiger Supplies, tigersupplies.com, Trimble Geospatial, geospatial.trimble.com.